As we kick off the new year, we're focusing our attention on the critical issue of what is the church? And this is a particularly important question for Rancho Baptist Church at this time in our history. Over the last year and change, we've been kind of taking stock as to where we have been, and even more importantly, we've been evaluating where we're going. It's, it's all too easy for us as a church to be like the, the commercial airline pilot who got on the in-flight intercom to welcome his passenger shortly after takeoff. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is your captain. I want to take a moment to thank you for flying with us, but also to let you know that I have some good news and I have some bad news. The good news is that due to a significant tailwind, we are cruising along at 600 miles per hour. The bad news is that I'm really not quite sure where we're going just yet. And in a similar fashion as a church, it can be all too easy for us to become immersed in frantic activity and even good frantic activity, but kind of lose track of where we're headed. And this morning, I'd like to continue exploring this question of what is the church? A couple of weeks ago, Pastor Rick looked at the church in Acts chapter 2 as it was birthed. And in this passage, we saw the unique priorities and the unique environment of the early church. Last week in John's high, or the Lord's High Priestly Prayer in John chapter 17, we explored the church's overall purpose of glorifying God. We drilled this down more significantly and more specifically into three mindsets that we really must adopt as we glorify God in our relationship to the world in particular. This week I'd like to kind of fast forward 30 years from Jesus' prayer in John 17 and look at one of the most prominent churches that was planted by the Apostle Paul, and that was the church at Ephesus. In particular, we're going to examine the practices that Paul wanted to see implemented in this church. But before we look at this morning in this in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 3-5, through 5, we need to consider some background information. And Paul established the Ephesian church in 54 AD, about 20 years or so after Jesus' death and resurrection. The church grew quickly under Paul's three-year pastoral leadership and became a strong and very well-established church. You can read about this growth in Acts chapter 19. And for the sake of today's study, it's important to know that Timothy was with Paul throughout his ministry in the Ephesian church. And thus, the Ephesian believers actually knew Timothy both as a friend and as a leader. Paul and Timothy briefly departed Ephesus, but returned again for a quick visit with the leadership in 57 AD. And during that stopover, Paul warned the Ephesian leaders that false teachers were going to arise from within their own leadership team preaching false doctrine and attempting to attract followers for themselves. He exhorted these church leaders to be on the lookout for these folks and to protect the flock from their false teaching. You can read about this in, in the second half of Acts chapter 20. Well, about six years after that, in 63 AD, after Paul had been released from his first imprisonment in Rome, he wrote first Tim the Timothy, to Timothy, the first Timothy letter. And now with this background under our belt, turn in your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3, and read along as we pick up the adventures of Paul and Timothy right there. Now Paul said to Timothy, he said, As I urged you upon my departure from Macedonia, remain on at Ephesus so that you may instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrines, nor to pay attention to myths and, and endless genealogies which give rise to mere speculation rather than furthering the administration of God, which is by faith. And I'm going to stop right there. So we learned that Paul and Timothy, were, they're both back in Ephesus again and ministering to the Ephesian believers. 
And evidently, just as Paul had predicted, guess what? The false teachers had come out to play. And they were likely elders in the Ephesian church, and Paul had actually already excommunicated a couple of these false teaching elders. But there were still a few remaining in the church that needed to be dealt with. And Paul needed to head off to Macedonia, so he urged Timothy to stay on in Ephesus and shepherd this church through this really difficult time. And the first Timothy letter was penned to remind Timothy of what he needed to focus on during his ministry there in Ephesus. So Timothy's first order of business in helping this church to function rightly, according to our text this morning, was to authoritatively instruct or command the remaining false teachers to forsake their errant doctrine. Their wayward teaching was resulting only in speculation and controversy rather than a sincere faith in Christ. And make no mistake, clear, authoritative, accurate instruction and in teaching of God's Word must always be a high priority in any God-glorifying church. Back at the very beginning of the book of Acts, uh, notice what the priorities were right in the first church. They were continually devoting themselves to what? The apostles' teaching and to prayer and to the breaking of bread. The first thing that the early church focused on was the apostles' teaching, which these men had heard directly from the mouth of Jesus. And as the second person of the triune Godhead, Jesus' teaching was indeed the word of God. Paul firmly reinforced this same priority to Timothy as he pastored the Ephesian church. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 2, he said, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is the judge of the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. And that instruction is the same word as in the text we're looking at this morning. And why was clearly teaching the scripture so important? Notice what Paul reminded Timothy of in 2 Timothy chapter 3, 16 and 17. He said, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate and equipped for every good work. The scriptures are the means by which God brings both forth repentance and faith in Christ. But the scriptures are also the tools that the Spirit of God uses to transform us into Christ's likeness and to make us salt and light in the world. That's why clearly teaching the scriptures must always remain a top priority in Christ's church. Paul adds a very important clarification for Timothy to remember as he teaches this truth. Look back at our text in 1 Timothy 1 and verse 5 in particular. He says, but the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. And what an important clarification that is. You see, the goal of teaching God's word is is not, it's not head knowledge. It, the goal is not so that we could have solid doctrine, even though solid doctrine is obviously very, very important. Love must be the goal of all scriptural teaching. And this critical concept, the, the centrality of love as the goal of our teaching flows very logically from the emphasis of love that really permeates all of Scripture. Look at the, the Last Supper, the day before Jesus was crucified. Look what Jesus told his disciples. He said, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. And when quizzed by an expert in the Jewish law regarding what was the greatest commandment in the Old Testament, notice what Jesus said. He's, Jesus replied back to him and he said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. This is the great and foremost commandment. 
The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole of the law and the prophets. The Apostle Paul also commanded the Ephesian flock, which he was ministering to. He said, therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love, just as Christ also loved you. And looking back in our primary text in 1 Timothy 1, verse 5, the love that Paul describes here is the agape love of God himself. It's the love that motivated the Father to give his only begotten Son to save us. It's the, the patient, self-sacrificing love that God the Son had for his stubborn, prideful disciples while he is on the earth. And it's the love that the Apostle John says is inherent in all that God is and God does. God is love. This agape love must be the goal of all of our teaching and preaching of the scriptures. Also look again at 1 Timothy 1.5 and notice that the love that Paul mentions here, it doesn't have an object. He doesn't specify to Timothy that the goal of this love is love for people or even love for God. The goal is simply agape love. And the reason why Paul doesn't specify an object is because love is directed at all the above. It's everything. The goal of our instruction from the scriptures must be love for God and love for others. It's both. And when you think about this, this makes sense. After all, loving God and loving others is the great commandment of the scriptures according to Jesus that we just read. Now, not surprisingly, the Rancho Baptist Church mission statement reflects this foundational priority of love. Here's the mission statement. Rancho Baptist Church exists to glorify God by making disciples who love God, love others, and live to reach their world for Christ. So if according to Paul, the goal of all our teaching and preaching is love for God and love for others, how do we practically apply this in our lives? In other words, based on the scriptures, what should this look like in everyday life here at RBC? First of all, let's talk about what our love for God should look like in our everyday life. In the scriptures, love for God seems to be at a minimum characterized by two different things. The first prominent part of love for God is a hunger for God and a seeking of his presence. In Psalm 42 verses 1 through 2, the psalmist cries out, as the deer pants for the water brook, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? And in Psalm 63, verse 1, a different psalmist, David, eagerly exclaims, Oh God, you are my God. I shall seek you earnestly. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh yearns for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Men and women who truly love the Lord long to be with him and to know him in an experiential way. They devote time each day to seek the Lord and listen to his voice through the pages of scripture. And they seek to abide in his presence all day long. They work at maintaining an ongoing conversation with the Lord as much as possible throughout their waking hours. These are significant parts of what it means to love God. Now the second part of a love for God is a spirit empowered commitment to do the will of God. In John chapter 14, verse 15, Jesus simply put it this way. He said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Pretty straightforward. The Apostle Paul echoed a similar idea in 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 15, when he said, for the love of Christ controls us. Having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died, and he died for all so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Men and women who love the Lord as a loving 
act of their will as a love responds to the God that loves them have renounced living to please for themselves, to live for themselves. They have also announced that they have committed themselves to pleasing Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. Love for God that doesn't embrace the Lordship of Christ is an incomplete love at best. Well, having considered what our love for God looks like in daily life, let's explore what our love for others should look like. First of all, loving others means that we involve ourselves deeply in the lives of those around us. Notice what John comments about Jesus and his involvement with his disciples. He said, Now therefore, before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that the hour had come, that he would depart out of the world, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. For three years, as he spent time with these men, he loved them. Even up to the point when he knew he was going to die, he kept on loving them. And the Apostle Paul echoes a similar theme in his intense involvement with the Ephesian believers. He said, therefore, be on the alert, remembering that night and day for a period of three years, all the time, I did not cease to admonish each one of you with tears. That's involvement. You see, running into the worship service each week and then quickly running out of, into our cars to head home is not what the Lord would have us do on a regular basis. We need to take the time to, to interact with one another so that we can know how to lovingly serve one another. And this loving interaction is not limited to just our friends. We must seek to know people who are new to the church and even connect pe with people we haven't met. This loving involvement means that we even seek to connect with people who may even make us a little bit uncomfortable. This expression of loving one another needs to really become, and I believe already is to a great extent, the heartbeat of our church. And this loving involvement is not only a deep connection with those in the church body, but also with those who are in the world without Christ. Jesus was accused by the religious leaders of his day of being a friend of tax gatherers and sinners. He ate meals with them. He preached the gospel to them. He begged them to come to him that they might find rest for their souls. And make no mistake, these, were, these people were very different than Jesus. They likely, they cursed and they likely swore and they lived out very different lifestyles than what Jesus lived out, most likely. Frankly, if I was hanging out with these folks, I, I have, kind of have a suspicion that I probably wouldn't have been particularly comfortable with them. The question I found myself asking me is this. If the religious leaders of today observe my life for a month, would there be enough evidence to accuse me of being a friend of sinners like Jesus? And I'm ashamed to admit that I don't think that such an accusation would be leveled at me. And candidly, the deficiency really, it reveals a, a heartbreaking lack of love in my heart. And I have uh, had to repent of this hardness of heart and ask the Lord for cleansing and seeking his grace to, to change me. And confronted with the same question, maybe, maybe you found yourself in the same boat as me. The goal of our instruction needs to be love for others, both inside and outside the body of Christ. Whether it's comfortable or not. Whether it's comfortable or not. A second part of loving others means that, we, that as we deeply involve ourselves in their lives, we must seek to serve them. In the scriptures, we see that God loved us and his love led him to serve us. Jesus commented, he said, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. And like our Lord, love demands that we do the same for one another. In Galatians 5.13, Paul tells the Galatian believers, he says, 
if you were, you were called to freedom, brethren, only don't turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love, serve one another. And the word that Paul uses here for serve is the word for attending one another's needs like a slave. It's the doulos word. Out of love for one another, we must serve one another, even as we have been lovingly ministered to by our Lord. This type of servant love also means that we serve those in the world as well. Jesus sought to meet the needs of non-believers so that they might, he might address their greatest need, which was for salvation. Love demands that we do this since we are called to imitate our master in this. And the goal of our instruction, the solid biblical teaching, must be this type of servant love for one another, both inside and outside of our church. The conclusion of the message this morning is, is actually kind of sobering. I'm very confident that Timothy was faithful to accurately and consistently instruct the Ephesian church from the Word of God. After all, this priority had been drilled into him by his mentor, the Apostle Paul. And I'm equally sure that Timothy communicated and modeled love for God and love for others, which was the goal of his preaching and teaching. Now, interestingly, the scriptures tell us where the Ephesian church ended up 30 years after Timothy's ministry. Turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 2, verse 1, and read along with me. This is 30 years after Timothy's ministry. Ephesians 2, or Revelation 2, 1. To the angel, probably the pastor, of the church at Ephesus at the time, write, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands, Jesus himself, here's what he says. I know your deeds and your toil and your perseverance and that you cannot tolerate evil men. And you put to the test those who call themselves apostles and they're not. And you found them to be false. And you have perseverance and you have endured for my name's sake and you have not grown weary. We're going to stop there. 30 years after Timothy's ministry to the church in Ephesus, this church had been taught and they learned the scriptures well. They knew it so well that they could sniff out a false teacher from a mile away, and they did. They had also embraced the scripture's admonitions to persevere in their faith for Christ's sake, even in the midst of suffering. In summary, they, they were well taught, and they were completely committed to Christ. And Jesus sincerely commends them for this. Well done, Ephesian church leaders and congregation. Good job. Look at verse 4, though. Same text. But this I have against you, that you have left your first love. Thirty years down from Timothy's ministry, this church was still teaching the scriptures accurately. But they had lost track of the fact that the goal of of all instruction from God's word is love. Both love for Jesus and love for others. In fact, the term used in this text for left means that they had abandoned their first love. In other words, they had they'd had it before, but they actually kind of walked away from it. And in verse 5, Jesus tells them that if they don't repent and return to this first love, that their church would be judged. My fervent prayer 
for myself and for RBC going forward into the future is that we would never abandon our staunch commitment for teaching God's Word. We're known for that. And that is a good thing. But even more important, I'm imploring the Lord that He would help me and help us to excel and never leave our passionate love for Him and our fervent love for others. May the Lord help us to cling tightly to both of these critical priorities. Will you join me in that prayer? Both for yourselves and for Rancho Baptist Church. Let's pray. Lord, we, we need you to work in our hearts. In the depths of our souls, all of us grasp what the hymn writer meant when he explained, prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. Lord, that's me, that's us. We need you to change our hearts so that, that we would passionately teach and embrace your word, but with even greater zeal that we would seek to love you and love others. Strengthen us so that we would tenaciously cling to both of these critical priorities. Only you can do this work in my heart, in our hearts, Lord, and we implore you to accomplish this so that you would be glorified in our flock at RBC and that those in the community around us would Know the love of Christ by watching it displayed among us. Lord, we would ask this in Jesus' glorious name and for his sake. Amen.